Uh, my name's Matt, and uh, your DJ for the evening is my little, uh, beautiful little girl, Leah. Uh, I am not a member, well, I am a member of Lights, but as a parent. Uh, I'm not a social worker. I'm not in the medical community. I actually, uh, I work as a, uh, a software guy, a software company in Richmond Hill. Uh, I'm a single dad, and uh, it's just been Leah and myself for the past 10 years or so. Um, and I've been involved in Leah, I was there in the delivery room when Leah was first arrived. And I've been involved in Leah's care in every aspect. Every doctor's appointment, every surgery, every thing, I've been there. Uh, and like I said, for the past 10 years, it's just been the two of us. So when Zoe asked me to give a presentation for Lights for tonight, I was kind of like, are you kidding me? Me? <laughs> Leah just turned 18. She just transitioned into adulthood last October. I'm still in the middle of this process of transitioning her into adulthood. And I thought, wow, I, what am I going to talk about? What can I possibly tell you that you know, people haven't heard already? Um, but you know, when I thought about it, uh, well, quick show of hands, how many people here are single parents like me? And how many single parents out there have children with spina bifida? And L3's, L3 myel myelomeningocele spina bifida with bilateral shunted hydrocephalus and uh, the recent diagnosis of autism? <laughs> yeah? Autism. No? Okay. I just found out. We just got an uh, autism diagnosis last August. So, you know, this, it, it often feels to me like nobody gets it. Nobody understands what I'm going through. I've got family members who are out of town, and uh, I've got friends, and they're helpful. They, they, they watch Leah every once in a while, and they do things, and it's great. It's wonderful. But they don't get it. They don't, they don't get what it's like to be me and living with Leah and growing up. They don't, they don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not part of it like I have been since the beginning. And really, it feels very, you know, there are times it feels very isolated, very alone, uh, very difficult, you know. And the system myself, I feel, wow, it's, it's intimidating. <laughs> it's, it's very intimidating. And I feel overwhelmed with it sometimes. It can be very challenging. So, you know, how many, again, how many single parents here tonight? And how many people have children in a wheelchair? How many people have children with autism? Or maybe um, G-tube feedings? Or catheterizations? Yeah, and see, the, the more I look around, I see, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really the part of it. It's, that, it's not that isolation feeling that we feel because nobody has the one single answer that I need for Leah's future. Nobody, because I'm alone in it. But looking around, there's at least half the people here tonight have some aspect or some understanding of what I might be going through, whether it's from the autism level or being a single parent or being uh, having somebody in a wheelchair. And that's what Zoe was talking about in the first half. It's the networking piece that's so important, right? And we really, every one of us here has different stories about our kids. Every one of us has come from different places, and I get that. But we're all going through the same system, right? Sometimes it's not funny. <laughs> uh, we're all going through the same system. We're all going through DSO, and we're all going through ODSP. And you know, maybe if there's something that I can talk about tonight that you can get that would help fill in your piece of the puzzle, then it'd be worth it. So yeah. So there's, I don't know if you can see this clearly, there's Lee and me, we went to uh, Disney World and uh, Universal Studios uh, last um, Thanksgiving, just before Lee had turned uh, 18. Uh, and this was, uh, this was one aspect of uh, transitioning to adulthood that I didn't think of, and maybe you can, it's uh, the Children's Wish Foundation because our trip to Orlando was sponsored entirely by Children's Wish. 
Uh, and I had never thought of it because, you know, I, I'd asked Leah what she had wanted and she really didn't have any answers for me. She didn't really know what she wanted. But then uh, uh, I'd been speaking to somebody at SickKids, and I'll get to that part in a bit. And they said, well, you know, as soon as your child turns 18, they don't qualify for Children's Wish anymore. So if you're going to get a wish, better do it now before she turns 18. So we did, and we had the time of our lives. She's trying to throw up the peace sign here, but she's still figuring out which fingers are going up. But we had a great time. <clears throat> and I'm glad that Zoe mentioned person-directed planning because I started on Leah's plan about three years ago, March 2014. I figured, uh, you know, I really have to start thinking about what I'm going to do with Leah in the future. Sure, she's going to school right now, and she's going to go to school until she's 21, but then what happens? And you know, you, you probably know as well as I do, the wait lists for everything are enormous. And my family, they said, Leah's only 15 years old, what are you doing an adult plan for her at age 15? I'm like, yeah. Pff. It takes three years to get through some of these plans. It takes a lot of time to get some answers from people or to get through the wait lists. So I felt like I needed to get started when she was 14, 15 years old. So I arranged a person-directed plan for Leah at her school. And uh, it was Leah and myself, and Leah's teacher, and uh, Petra from uh, Community Living, um, who does person-directed plans. And we got together in quite literally a broom closet at Leah's school and put a huge piece of paper up on the wall and started writing ideas and Leah's plan down. And we started by writing what Leah's likes and dislikes. And just some random thoughts were things that Leah might be interested in. And then we got some contributions from Leah's teacher. We wrote all those down in a little cloud on the piece of paper. And we started talking about what Leah's dream would be. Now, again, I've been with Leah since the beginning. And we've been living together for the past 10 years. I am the expert on Leah. Nobody knows Leah better than me. I've got all the answers. So, or so I thought. <laughs> I was wrong. When we started talking about what Leah's dream was, one of the questions that came up was, where do you want to live? And I thought, well, she's going to say she wants to live with dad. It's always been that way. She was given the option. She's like, do you want to live with family or do you want to live on your own? I'm like, yeah. I had already made my bed. I'd said, you know what? I'm going to be taking care of her the rest of my life. This is my lot in life, and I had accepted that. She's going to live with me for the rest of my life. So when they asked her, where do you want to live? Yeah, she's going to say she wants to live with dad. Yeah, of course she is. No. She wants to live in an apartment downtown Toronto over top of a fire station. But that's her dream. That was her dream. And for the first time, it really opened my eyes and made me think, this little person that I have, she has aspirations of her own, and I really, I really wasn't listening to what she had to say. And it was a real wake-up call for me. So it was a very, even her teacher kind of was blown away. It's like, I can't believe Leah really wanted that because she's never, ever said anything. So it was really fascinating to go through. And then when we kind of got over our initial shock of the parts of her dream, we got together and thought, well, what do we need in order to make that dream succeed for her? What ideas can we come up with to make it succeed? And I took a screen capture of that little ideas to make it succeed. And unfortunately, you probably can't read it all too well here, but there's a couple of things I want to point out in there. One of them is the medical transition from child to adult care. And that's pretty vague, <laughs> because there's a lot of stuff that has gone into that. But uh, I started thinking about that three years ago, in 2014, what I needed to do to make that happen. And the other one in here, which really, here it is, networking with other parents. So when I went back and I looked at Leah's plan, I was like, yeah, and Zoe asked me to give her a presentation. I'm like, that was my promise to Leo three years ago, that I would start networking with other parents and start making roles and contributions and trying to get more pieces of Leah's puzzle together. 
Uh, we came up with an action plan, things for Leah's teacher to do, things for me to do uh, over the last couple of years. And we're going pretty well on this plan so far, but we do have to update it. Leah's an adult now. Maybe some of her plans have changed. Maybe some things that she wants need to be changed. So we're going to talk about, uh, well, Leah and I and our contributors are going to talk about what the next steps are for Leah. And we also talked about what challenges are going to take place in order to make Leah's dream a reality. Yeah. Of course, one of the biggest challenges is finances, right? Everything changes, or everything changed when Leah turned to 18. And I knew it. I knew everything was going to change, but it still didn't prepare me for it. It was almost, it, sometimes it really felt like being pushed off a cliff. It was like, okay, well, you're at Sick Kids. You've got the best medical care in the country. You've got all of these wonderful services and people who are willing to stand up and do all these great things for children. But you're 18 now. You're no longer a child. You don't qualify for children's wish. You don't qualify for assistance for children with severe disabilities. You don't qualify for uh, Easter Seals funding. I was getting Easter Seals funding for catheter supplies and stuff. You don't qualify for that anymore. So I had to build new networks, and I had to start thinking about where am I going to come up with finances for this. And Zoe touched upon DSO. Now, DSO is a huge part of Leah's plan because it's going to provide all of those after-school programs that I'm looking for when Leah turns 21. Right now, I've got a bit of leeway. She's 18, turning 19. She's got two and a half years in high school. But of course, wait lists are huge, right? So we started the DSO process the second Leah turned 17 and a half. I was, I was just waiting for that, that ball to drop so I can start planning DSO stuff. It's a multi-step process if you've never gone through DSO before. The first step of the process is that you have to fill in the application. Then you have to wait. You have to wait for a very long time. It could be six, nine months, whatever, for something called an SIS interview, Support Intensity Scale Interview. It's longer now, yeah. Because there are so many, you know, and I understand this as a parent. DSO started just a few years ago, so there are lots of people. And think about it, it's people from 18 to 118, right, who are going through this process. They're all grouped as adults. So even though we have children that are going through this process as new members to it, I mean, there everybody who has been part of these systems up to this point have to go through DSO now. So they are very backlogged with those support intensity scale interviews. I was lucky. If you're going to sick kids with your children, uh, I'd recommend looking into something called the Good to Go program. Good number two, go. It's run by sick kids. Leah and I got into it, and it was great. Instead of waiting nine months for our support intensity scale interview, we waited three weeks. And in three weeks, we had our interview. And in the interview, somebody from DSO comes, and they sit down, and they have a huge questionnaire about what the child's capability is to do X, Y, and Z. What's Leah's capability to catch a bus on her own? What's Leah's capability to feed herself, to prepare her meals, to do it's everything? It took hours to go through this whole interview. But uh, we went through that interview, and fortunately, we didn't have to wait for nine months for it. Good to go. Uh, Good to go is also the organization at uh, Sick Kids that said, have you thought about the Children's Wish program? Never did. But they helped me fill out the application for Children's Wish, and we got through that. After you've gone through your SIS interview with DSO, they'll give you a score. And the score is kind of a, a support intensity, right? It's an intensity score, judging where your child is and what their, uh, their, their intensity for support might be. And I guess this is used to rank, in a way, who has the most need. That's my understanding of it, anyway. Uh, and once you've got that, then you have to wait again for passport funding. So I'm always calling DSO. Personally, I'm calling DSO once a month and saying, hi, it's me. Any passport funding come up? No, nothing again, Matt. You still have to wait a couple of years. <laughs> yes, it's a couple of years wait, at least. 
uh, in order to get passport funding. But again, if you don't start now, when Leah gets, turns 21 and comes out of high school, what am I going to do? I have a full-time job. I, am I going to be staying at home full-time taking care of her if I don't have a program for her to go into? So I'm, I'm really getting on DSO at least once a month and talking to someone and saying, hey, is there any passport funding available out there? Are there any programs? And programs are the next part that Zoe had talked about too. You'll see things for a DSO information fair that come up from time to time. These are fantastic. I love these. I always look forward for DSO information fairs. I think one's coming up in July, I saw, June or July. I think I saw something about that. Anyway, look for DSO information fairs because this is an opportunity where everybody, all of these non-government plans, and all, everybody gets together and they have booths set up and you can find more about plans that are available. So I'm looking for life skills plans for Leah. I'm looking for day programs that she might be able to participate in. And again, the wait lists are two years long. So if I'm going into this DSO information fair in whatever it might, the next one might be in July or whatever, I'm gonna get her name on some of those programs now while I still can. And hopefully by the time she's ready to go into the program, I'll have passport funding in place to pay for it. And there'll be a spot ready for her when she comes out of high school. Wishful thinking. <laughs> but again, if you don't start early, you know, you might be spending the next couple of years sitting at home thinking, what am I going to do about going to work on a daily basis? Uh, ODSP is uh, also a really big part again. Zoe talked about that too, uh, the Ontario Disability Support Program. And again, I started this early. If your child is 17 and a half, you can fill in the application online for ODSP. And again, you know, happy 17 and a half birthday, Leah. I'm going to do your ODSP application for you. And uh, it is a multi-step process again. You do the application online. You get a call from ODSP to come in for a little interview. And they give you a stack of paperwork to take to your medical professionals. Say, how disabled is your child? Now, a couple of things that you might want to consider going into that interview with ODSP, things that I, I really didn't know about until I got there. Your child's an adult when they turn 18. They have to sign their own stuff. They're responsible for bringing their own little signatures on things and saying, yeah, I have the capacity to understand what I'm saying. I certify that I understand and I, I read this and I make sense and I approve it. Leah doesn't have that capacity. So when I went for my first DSO interview and they said, well, she's got to sign for it. I said, okay, sure, she can sign. But she doesn't understand what she's signing. Oh, that was a challenge. So then I had to go back to Leah's medical professionals and get a couple of letters to say, she doesn't really have the capacity to understand what she's signing. Mr. Swan has been working as a capacity of Leah's trustee for the past X number of years. Please consider him to be Leah's trustee in this. And I'll talk about things like power of attorney later on in my presentation too. Um, but this, this has been kind of dogging me ever since, this whole, she's 18, she has to sign for her own stuff. This has been dogging me now for the last six, seven months. Uh, it's happened with ODSP, and now it's happening with CRA because our income tax has to be in by May 1st, right? Lee's been receiving ODSP since October, and she got, uh, I think it's a T4 something, some T4 slip for the amount of ODSP that she received for 2016, so I have to do her taxes. The Government of Canada won't give me any information about my own child's account because she's an adult. So there's a special form you can fill out. <laughs> I'll get to that later too. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is RDSP. How many people have heard of RDSPs? Great. How many people have an RDSP? Awesome. Aren't they the best thing ever? Yeah. Ever. They are the greatest. If you've never heard of an RDSP, it's a Registered uh, Disability Savings Plan, different from an RRSP in a couple of ways. You cannot walk into your regular bank and say, I'd like to open an RDSP account. I learned that again the hard way. Bank people just kind of looked at me and said, what's that? Uh, but I went to a financial advisor and my financial advisor was able to open up an RDSP account for me. 
And if you've never had one before, I don't know all of the details of it, but I do know that pretty much for every dollar that you contribute up to a certain ceiling, 1500 a year, thanks, the government will give you like $3 in return. So in a very short time, I've only had an RDSP account for Leah for a year, maybe a year and a half now. It's worth five times what I've contributed to it. Five times. It is. It's the best program that the government has there. The only problem is these RDSPs are long-term solutions. You can't really access the funds for like 20 years or something. Penalties. There's penalties, yeah. Yeah, there's penalties if you if you withdraw early from it. But yeah. But uh, it's a long-term solution. The other thing that I learned, unfortunately, the hard way again with RDSPs is that these contrib uh, contributions you make into your RDSP are not tax deductible. It's not like contributing into an RRSP where you can write that off on your income tax at the end of the year. If you put money into an RDSP, you, can, you cannot accept that as a, uh, as a charitable tax donation. So. But still, you know, it's worth four or five times what I actually invested in it. It's fantastic. I'm looking forward to having a secure future for Leah that way. Uh, there are other charitable organizations you can tap to for some funds. Uh, if you're part of Blue Review, I just found out about a new program they have called the Blue Review Family Fund, Holland Blue Review Family Fund. It's $1,000 a year used for respite services. So I'm going to use that $1,000 for Leah's summer camp at Holland Blue Review and for in-home respite. I really, really used the Ministry of Community Social Services at home, in-home respite things, like $3,500 a year. I used the heck out of that for summer programs and for programs for Leah. But again, she turned 18. She doesn't get any more. So it's only 1000 bucks for Blue Review, but they do allow for in-home respite care. I'm really looking into that. Um, a couple of things that I thought about and I just thought I'd share is when you do apply for ODSP, set up a joint account in your child's name. ODSP is going to want to deliver this money electronically to you. Uh, it's great if that goes into a joint account and if you're named as the, as the parent for that, then you have access to control your child's funds too. Leah doesn't have the capacity to control her own finances, so I do that for her. The other thing that I did is set up a joint account in my name with Leah's trustee. Does anybody here have a Henson Trust? Great. I'll talk a little bit about Henson Trusts if you've never heard about them next. But I set up a separate bank account with my name and the name of Leah's trustee. The trustee is the person who's going to take care of Leah's finances when I expire. So the fact about setting up this joint account, which makes it great, is everything that is in your bank account when you pass away is part of probate. It's part of your estate, which means it can be taxed by the government. Any money that you have set aside for your child in bank accounts is subject to tax by the government. But if it's set up in a joint account and you set it up in the account of the person who's named as your trustee for that Henson Trust, it's not part of your estate. So it's a great way of avoiding estate taxes, a legal way of avoiding estate taxes and giving the money to the person who's going to be taking care of your child and their finances when you pass away. Uh, I also set up a tax-free savings account for Leah. Uh, she's still living with me, so I don't use all of her ODSP funds on a monthly basis. And I put a little bit of her ODSP funds into her RDSP to grow it a bit. And some of that I put into a tax-free savings account. So it kind of counterbalances. I have to claim what she receives from ODSP at the end of the year. But if it goes, some of it goes into a tax-free savings account, it brings that number down a bit. And I have that money in a savings account for Leah in the future. So I'm planning on using this money. I'm setting up a little nest egg for her so that when she is ready to move into her own place in maybe five or 10 years, I've got a nest egg that I can go into and have set up costs for her. Um, the other thing is to keep your T2201 up to date. That's your disability tax credit certificate. When your child turns 18, congratulations, they're no longer disabled. I learned that again the hard way. 
uh, all of a sudden I got a notice about Leah's RDSP for 2017 saying that the eligible contributions were zero that the government would give me absolutely zero in return. And it's because her disability tax credit certificate expired on her birthday. It's like, congratulations, your child's an adult. She's no longer disabled. Really? <laughs> so I had to fill in a new disability tax credit certificate in order to get my RDSP funds available to me. And I needed it in order to fill, uh, file my income taxes for May. So, something to think about. Gina, go on, thanks. Uh, one of the big lessons I learned about it, and really goes back to that uh, uh, meeting that I had uh, with Leah's teacher, was learning to let go. And I am still learning this. It's hard. Because for 18 years of Leah's life, I have been everything. I've been bathing her, I've been dressing her, I've been feeding her, I take her to all of her doctor's appointments, I have to manage her schedule, I have to go to her school meetings, I've been doing all of this stuff. And then I went to that meeting for her person-directed plan and I found out <laughs> there's a little person in there who has her own dreams that I'm not even aware of. And it was a real wake-up call. I went to another lights meeting maybe three or four months ago. I can't remember it was. But it was a, a great meeting that we had at lights with uh, the talking about uh, your child's rights, your legal rights, and the human rights code. It was a great meeting. Because it really made me think that it's more than just my child's right to express herself, but it's a legal right. It's like a human rights code thing. And it, it, it really struck me, and I, I went home that evening and I thought, wow, you know, I'm really gonna have to start asking Leo what she wants to do and I start letting her make decisions of what her life looks like. And admittedly, I still need work on that because I was doing it very closed-ended. I was asking Leah, well, Leah, do you wanna, just as an exaggeration, do you want to uh, go to Ikea with me or do you wanna go to the dentist? <laughs> Well, what is she going to say, right? Well, I'm going to Ikea with you. Forget that. But I've learned, uh, and I'm still learning, really, to give her more choice. That's an exaggeration, but I'm, I'm still learning to give her more choice in things. And a, a good example of this is when we went to the restaurant a couple weeks ago. For years, every time we walked into a restaurant, this is what it looked like. Leah would get on her iPad. She'd put her headphones on. She'd be in Leah land. I would order from the menu, eat. She doesn't eat, everything is going through the G-tube. She'd taste some of her food, I'd check in with her and see if she wanted to try some things. But, you know, this is what it was like for us in a restaurant. About a month or so ago, we went into a restaurant and uh, I was just waiting for the bill and Leah said to me, I want French fries. And I was blown away. <laughs> like, I never even bothered to ask you if you wanted anything. I said, Leah, I'm very sorry. From now on, I'm going to ask you if you want to order something in a restaurant. She said, OK, Daddy. So the next time we went, she said, mashed potatoes. <laughs> and she had mashed potatoes. And she was happy. She didn't need any of them, but she had mashed potatoes. It's her right to be able to express herself. So I'm still learning to let go. I'm no longer her caregiver. I'm kind of her secretary. It only gets worse. It only gets worse, I know. But you know, I, I, and this goes back to something I'd said at the top of my presentation, that I had really resigned myself to Leah living with me for the rest of my life, and her life, or our lives, whatever it came to. And I had to step back and think, wait a second, that might not be what she wants. What does she want? So I had to step back from being the caregiver and start thinking about what she really wanted and how to make that happen. And it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard for me because I, I always want to be there and I always want to do everything for her, right? You want to do everything for your kids and you have to, had to, you've had to do that for your kids all of this time. So being able to step back and having them to act as a coordinator or a facilitator for your children. It's, it's been a real challenge for me. But Leah knows what she makes her happy. iPad, hummus, apple juice. She knows. And if I just listen to her for other things, then, you know, we can work together on it. Yeah. And that gives me an opportunity to work more for myself. 
Uh, I love this quote, and I, I keep it on a little post-it note near my computer. And when it, the glue dries on the post-it note, I write it out again. Uh, I've really learned in the past few years since we did Leah's person-directed plan to start doing more things for myself, too. And I was using the Ministry of uh, Community and Social Services, that in-home respite, to go to spinning classes on Thursday nights. Or um, just go on a date. <laughs> what the heck, you know, I'm, st I'm 48, I'm still young. Um, to go on a date or do something or take a class, get a hobby. I, I had a, I worked with respiteservices.com, if you've never done that, great facility too. We have a uh, PSW that comes in for Leah. Wonderful, wonderful person. She's just fantastic. And she'll come in on a Saturday morning and I'll join my cycling team and go for a three or four hour bike ride with my team. Um, and I try and schedule regular time off. You know, sitting in front of the TV for me was not time off. But going out on a Thursday night, for even if it was just to sit at Starbucks and read a book, that was time off for me. Or uh, using Safe Haven for inpatient respite, and Leah would go to Safe Haven for a couple of days while I went home to Niagara. Or play games with friends, whatever it was. Uh, I plan vacations now with and without Leah. The vacation that we did uh, at uh, Disney and Universal Studios was a planned vacation with a family. But May 1st, my girlfriend and I were going on a vacation on a cruise. So, and, and I need some of that time myself. I, I try to at least once per year get a week where it's just the grown-ups. You know, I feel like I need that every once in a while to reconnect with my girlfriend, to give myself a break too, because I can't pour from an empty cup. Other things that uh, I, I really had to think about when taking care of yourself, having an annual physical done, um, I found out I had high blood pressure. Who knew? A doctor, apparently. But um, getting a physical and doing my will. I had my will drawn up uh, about two years ago with something called a Henson Trust. If you've never heard of a Henson Trust before, it's basically taking all of the money from your estate, liquidating it, and putting it into a trust account, which is managed by one or more people, to give money to your child to support them. My cousin is going to be the trustee for my Henson Trust. So if any, my cousin's like a sister to me. So if anything happens to me, then all of my money from the estate goes into this trust account, and my cousin gives a certain amount of money to make sure that Leah has everything that she needs. You have to balance that a little bit with ODSP, because there's a clawback with ODSP. If you give a certain amount from the Henson Trust, then ODSP will claw some of the money back that they give to you. But you know, if Leah needs a new computer, or a new iPad, as the case may be, I know that money will be there from my trust to pay for things that she needs going forward. Okay. Other things to consider, uh, speaking about the uh, will, this third bullet point that I have here, a letter to accompany your will. If you've never drawn up your will before, it's a very dry legal document. It talks about basically the money that goes into your estate and where is it going. You can't add all of these crazy things that you see in movies where you have to stay a night in this haunted house. You can't do that in Ontario, which is unfortunate. But um, I wrote a letter to accompany the will because nobody is a better expert on Leah than myself. My cousin is wonderful, she's great, she's like a sister to me, but she's still a little intimidated by Leah's disability, and I get that. So I had to write out all of Leah's doctor's names and uh, what her medication is, little things that uh, Leah enjoys or uh, whatever it might be. I wrote this huge, huge letter saying, who accompanied my will to say, these are directions. You can't actually write those directions in your will. You can't give directions to the trustee. The trustee has 100% discretion on how the money is spent. But you can accompany a little letter to your will to say, these were my wishes, truly. So I, I recommend doing that. I also recommend coming up with a family emergency plan. And I know I've spoken quite a bit, but um, last May, uh, being the, the hero that I was, I got up on a ladder to fix my girlfriend's air conditioner and fell off the ladder. 
six feet, uh, landed on my back, <laughs> on top of the leg of the ladder, <laughs> and broke three ribs. Uh, wow, that hurts. Ribs, breaking ribs is, is quite unpleasant. And I had to worry about Leah. Who's gonna be there to take care of her? What if it was worse and I had to spend days in hospital? What then? And it really made me think, geez, I need an emergency plan in case something happens to me that I'm not able to take care of Leah. I got like file binder and I attached it to her, her wheelchair lift to say, in case of emergency, here's all her doctor stuff, here's all her medication stuff, here's who to contact, uh, names, phone numbers, addresses, this person is really good for doing this, this person's really good for doing that, respite care, everything in case of emergency. I also keep an appointments log on my phone. Every single appointment that I go to with Leah, I write the date, the doctor, what we talked about, what the doctor said, everything. And it's become very, very useful for me too. And every time I go into ODSP to talk to them about something, or other doctors, because the medical care changes for adults than it does with child and children. And I'm still learning that. I'm still meeting new doctors for Leah. So if that doctor says, well, when's the last time you had an ultrasound done? I can go back through my phone and say, August 13th, 2016. Um, CRA form T1013. Remember when I was saying that your child has to sign everything when they turn 18? Same goes for their income taxes. If you get this form T1013, I think it's called the authorization of representation. It's a form for the government to say that you are authorized to do their tax, your tax things for their, your child. If your child has the capacity to sign that, that's the easiest way to do it. I had to get a letter from ODSP to say that I'm acting as Leah's trustee and Leah doesn't have the capacity to understand or sign what she's signing. So um, that gives me authorization to access Leah's income tax information. Uh, there, I looked into these two things, power of attorney and guardianship, as an alternative to that. Uh, and I spoke to the lawyer at um, SickKids to ask about it. Guardianship is like the bulletproof way of making sure that you have the ability to take care of everything having to do with your child. But I was discouraged from doing that because it's a lengthy process and it's an expensive process. Your child has to have a number of tests to determine capacity. And it's not just, you know, they're capable or incapable. It's not black and white. It's do they have the capacity to manage their own finances? Do they have the capacity to manage their own schedule? Do they have the capacity to do this, 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 this? And I can look at Leah and say, no, she doesn't have the capacity to do that. But maybe she has the capacity to do this. Not good enough. It's got to be done by a court-approved psychiatrist, which is about $2,500 for each test. So that's easy, 10,000 bucks, just for four capacity tests. Then you have to get the application to the court for guardianship and a lawyer to do that. $20,000, $25,000 right there. The other way of doing it is power of attorney. If your child has the capacity to understand their rights and do things, then they can sign power of attorney to you, which gives you the ability to act on their behalf. But they have to have the capacity to understand what they're signing. The power of attorney is great, but it expires when the child dies. So if your child unfortunately were to pass away, you would not have power of attorney over their estate anymore. Uh, it would go to the parents naturally, but then um, that's, the, that's the thing that the lawyer at Sick Kids had told me, that uh, the best way of, of dealing with it is to deal with it organically. That the, um, the law had been set up so that if the child doesn't have capacity, it automatically goes to family members, parents, siblings, whomever's available. And that's what we're doing. It, it hasn't been an easy process, as I've learned with ODSP and with doing at Leah's taxes, but it's, uh, it's working for us so far, and you know we are still in the middle of this. So that's all I had to say for tonight. I hope that 
got at least a little something because we are all in this system together. And if there is at least one thing that I could share with you tonight that made part of your puzzle work for you, then it was worth coming out here. Right.